Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a great show for you today. We have another horticulture educator, uh, Jamie Balsot. She'll be joining us from up in Cook County. Uh, but before we get to our special guest for the day, we have to introduce our hosts here every single week. Week? Can't talk. Uh, we are joined, of course, by local foods educator Katie Parker in Adams County. Hello, Katie. Hello, Chris. How are things going in Macomb? Now oh, things are just progressing the, in a grand way. I'm actually pretty excited. Our topic today is going to be seeds, uh, seeds starting, with all the catalogs coming in, and the fact that I think we've only seen the sun like two days in this last month. It's going to be nice. Just thinking of the future. How about yourself? Just itching to get started. Um, I was thinking the other day, we're recording this podcast. I want to get some seeds started too. So what are some that we can get started now or soon? Yeah. I am chomping at the bit to, I don't know, I, I got a lot of seed in the basement. I got to order some seeds. So I, yeah, I just, I'm excited to get into this. So let's introduce our other host uh, here, uh, Ken Johnson, horticulture educator in Jacksonville, Illinois. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris and Katie. We ordered our seed, or most of our seed last night. We ran into a few hiccups of places being out of stuff we wanted to buy and we're not taking orders. They'd shut down temporarily to catch up on everything. So if you haven't done it, get on it soon. Have the kiddos picked out the unique plants for this year? Because I know you guys like to grow maybe one or two different types of plants every year. So we're going to do peanuts and cotton again. Um, we're going to try to grow a marshmallow if we can get the seeds. Mm -hmm. The company we're going to get it from is currently not taking orders. So we'll have to wait and see if we can get that. Um, <clears throat> and we're going to try rice if we can get if the place we're going to order it from is going to... <laughs> When they take orders again, we'll we'll try to order some rice too. So those are going to be the two new ones this year. Well, we will keep track of that. Marshmallow, not marshmallow, marshmallow. Is that why the kids picked it too? Did you clear it through them? I wanted to and I convinced them. Yeah, you convinced <laughs> We're going to grow some marshmallows. Yeah. And rice. That will be exciting. Well, Ken, Katie, let's welcome our special guest uh, without further ado, because yes, we are super excited to be talking about Oh, what will be this year? Uh, Jaminy, thank you so much for being on the show. You're up in the Cook County neck of the woods. So what are you looking forward to this 2021 growing season as we get as we get things ramped up or we dream of it? Yeah, thanks for having me on the show again, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to, like you mentioned, see the sun again. I feel like it has been really difficult. Um, I grow a lot of indoor herbs and um, indoor plants in my apartment. And so I feel like they're really struggling right now. With yes. the sun. But of course, I'm really excited to get back in the garden. I have a community garden plot and we really um, intensively garden that each season. And so I'm really excited to get back into that in the spring. I have ginger, of course, and, you know, Ken and Katie know that my, I, I have ginger growing out of my ears. And so I um, it's in my basement and I have a grow light and one of the bulbs I noticed like in the fall, like, Oh gee, it's getting really dim. And now it's totally out. And so my, it, it wasn't enough light anyway, but now the ginger is seriously so stretched and leggy. It's just flopping over. It looks like I have straw, like grassy, like this grass, just like just trailing over my seed starting bench. And so I'm, I can't wait for some sunlight. So, um, it, as we look towards 2021, Jaminy, you know, Ken mentioned things are are a bit different. You know, some seed are, is not available anymore. I mean, uh, some seed suppliers are restricting when and what you can order. Um, wh why is this? Is it because more people are gardening? Is it because seed suppliers are there's shortages there? What's the reason why we're having a shortage this year? Yeah, that's a really good question and not something that I have really experienced since I've been a horticulture educator with um, U of I Extension. So I feel like this is a new phenomenon for everybody that's growing or teaching right now. But as far as I can tell with my research, it really is a demand issue. So it's not a supply issue. The seeds are there, but basically, right, seed sellers saw this massive increase in demand 
more than five times what they're used to in other years last spring in 2020, and they're anticipating the same thing for 2021. So gardening has increased while people are staying at home more, but they still want to get outside and gardening is the perfect activity to do while you're at home with your family. So although a lot of the companies are showing this like out of stock or none available on their websites, as far as I can tell, it's mostly an operations issue. So for example, they might not have enough time or enough people to fill the orders, especially when we think about social distancing requirements that are required for staff at these companies and facilities as well. So they're having a really hard time packaging the seeds for selling and really meeting the demand and being able to get the orders out in a timely manner. I, I do recall in 2020, the growers would say like the demand was so high. And so they thought maybe we could order more seed for a second crop, but then that pushes their fall crops. Um, whether you're a vegetable grower or a landscaper, you know, both of them, some, you know, one's growing food, one's growing ornamentals. And it's such a tight game, it seems like that they're, they're trying to push it quite a bit this year, it seems like. Exactly. And I know a lot of companies have tried to plan for that for 2021, but I guess we won't know until it happens. And so hopefully they were able to prepare as much as they possibly can, you know, throughout the last year. Yeah. I'll say for some of the packaging things, I know some of the, there are some Snapdragons we wanted to buy and you can't buy a packet of seeds, but you can buy 500 or a thousand seeds. So we don't need that many <laughs> Snapdragons <laughs> and stuff. And nor do I want to spend twenty dollars for some Snapdragon seeds. So I think that's another issue. Is just smaller quantities are are hard to come by too. You just become a seed salesman, Ken, and buy buy large quantities and start selling small quantities. Convert the yard into Snapdragons. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, what about seed production, Jamie? Obviously, the people producing it have to get it from somewhere. Can you tell us how they um, produce that seed that they sell? Yeah, so if you were gonna go to a seed production, either farm or company, you'd likely find something similar to a research farm or research facility, which I'm sure um, you all have been to before too, but much, much larger, right? On a way larger scale. So there'd likely be acres of plants, um, of plants whose seeds that they're growing, but they would be really meticulously labeled and organized, right? So they'd wanna know variety information and everything else about the growing conditions to make sure that those are the best high quality seeds that they could produce. There's also gonna be really large storage areas and these storage areas would have temperature controls and a lot of technology to ensure that the seeds don't um, lose any vigor in the storage process. Um, and then there'd be all the regular sort of supplies and infrastructure that we might be familiar with. So harvesters, pickers, you know, sort of sorting tables, areas to clean the seeds and then get them ready for storage and packing. Usually the storage, usually the packing would happen at a different facility, but I'm really speaking from my experience of visiting these like really large scale um, seed production farms. And so I'm wondering if maybe you guys have also visited some of these facilities and I might have left something out there. I just think they're beautiful. Um, you know, if you have a, a it, it, you're, you're right, it's kind of like research farm. You have these plots that if it's a flower seed that you're harvesting, well, you have to have the flower. And if you're there at the right time of year, you get to see the whole show. And it's really, really cool to, to watch a like a you know, a, an acre just in one block of one flower species. That's really fun and neat to see. Um, but I mean, you know, most of my experience has been mostly with like agronomic type seed production. So um, I, I really want to go visit, you know, one of those seed companies that do a diversity of different crops and, and ornamental plants. I think that would just be amazing to see uh, over the course of a growing season. But they use netting for um, like seed purity to prevent any cross-pollination? It depends. 
depends on the kind of plant that they're growing. I would say most often there's like cheaper ways to isolate plant varieties from each other. Um, so they would likely use either distance or only planting one variety at a time to isolate um, and to get the best quality seeds. But yeah, absolutely netting um, and things like that are absolutely used for isolation, but probably most often I would say used for pest management. All right, so you just touched on this a little bit. So obviously to get seeds, we need pollination, right? And then, so how do they control this process? Um, so you talk about distancing a little bit. Um, and if we're gonna do this at home, how would we do this at home? Yeah, so there's a lot of different ways you could do this. And all of these different things are called isolation techniques. Um, and it's used to isolate specific varieties from each other. So you can make sure that you're getting seeds that are true to type and have the traits that we want them to have. So this prevents that kind of unintended cross-pollination from occurring. And like I mentioned, what technique you use is really going to depend on the kind of plant, but on a basic level, you can use distance. So planting things really far away from each other. You can use planting time. So planting one variety um, at the beginning of the spring and one variety at the end of the spring. And then also those physical barriers like netting or bagging or something else. But you sure. have to make sure that um, you have, you can release that netting so the pollinators can get in because um, otherwise you won't have those seeds that you want. I think I, I, I've toured several different seed production. I think it was ball seed up in Chicago. They have some of their rooftop greenhouses where it's very high quality stuff that they're generating up there, stuff that they pollinate with a toothbrush or a Q-tip or something. And so that's a lot of labor to get uh, get a couple seeds off of that plant. I, I thought it was very fascinating to watch that process and how they isolate them in these little greenhouses up on the rooftops in Chicago. It was pretty neat to see. Yeah, I used to work for a wheat breeding lab when I was in school and we would have to pick out the flowers with tweezers and use them to like pollinate the specific other flowers. It was a very tedious, but super interesting process. So Jamie, we had you on last year, last, uh, I think it was late summer actually, uh, as people might've been thinking about seed saving. Uh, but as we're right here now in, in the winter months, and you kind of mentioned this by using distance to help control pollination and, and, and things, but are there other things we need to think about if we are, uh, you know, we want to become a seed saver this year and we want to plant our garden? Are there things that we need to consider about like plant placement or, you know, what, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I always recommend that people plan their gardens for seed saving if that's something that they're really interested in doing, because it's just going to set you up for the best success. So if you're a real beginner, I really recommend starting with saving seeds from annual self-pollinating plants. So things like peas or beans or tomatoes, they're going to give you seeds that grow to be really similar to the parent plants. And I think that's really just going to motivate home gardeners, you know, keep your confidence up and motivate you while you're seed saving. Um, and it's the second most important thing is probably knowing the pollination type of your plants. So maybe peas, beans, and tomatoes aren't that interesting to you. That's totally fine. But you want to make sure you know that your plants are either the ones that you're interested in growing are either self-pollinated or whether they're open pollinated. So these self-pollinated open varieties will require less isolation than their cross-pollinated varieties, um, especially if you as a gardener like to grow more than one variety in a season. So if you're growing multiple kinds of peppers, for example, you'll want to be careful about that. What about like little devices? I sometimes see people put like, how do I equate this? Like a mist netting, but it's like a little bag they put over the flowers. What, what is that for? Is that for more of that hybrid? Like they're trying to really control what pollen comes into contact with that flower. Exactly. So what they're doing is they're isolating specific flowers. So if you think of your tomato plant, you don't just have one flower on one plant, right? You'll have multiple flowers um, all over your plant. 
And so if you're getting really specific or maybe you're really limited on space too, you might just isolate a few flowers knowing that those are the plant, those are the fruits that you're gonna pick to save seeds from and the rest of the fruits all over the tomato, you're gonna pick to just eat. So it, the netting could be used for like full rows of plants or garden beds, but things like little bags or mesh bags, or I've even seen paper bags sometimes can be used for those like smaller flowers to get really specific. On some of our seed packets, there'll be an F1 hybrid label on it. What does that indicate and how are F1s different than heirloom or sorry, heirloom? So that's a really good question. And I get it really often. Basically, anytime I teach a master gardener training, I get this question. So I'm really excited that you asked it. So F1 stands for filial one. And that's really just the first generation of offspring. You are never going to need to know what the F stands for. But now you do. So just bear with me a little bit as I go through this like technical information, because this question is really all about genetics and breeding. And there's this whole industry that's dedicated to plant breeding. And so I'm going to kind of take you on a little journey here. So the F1 seeds are the seeds that have been saved from crossing to parent plants. So to get the F1 seeds that you buy in the store, first two parents need to be crossed and then those seeds are going to be your F1 hybrid seeds that you can buy. So this is usually done because each parent has a really specific trait that's really valuable for growers and the breeders want to be able to grow just one plant that has both those traits. So for example, parent one might be disease resistant and parent two might be drought resistant, but we really want a plant that's both disease resistant and drought resistant. So hence we're crossing these two parents. So these hybrid seeds are really good for growing that season because they're gonna have all the traits that you're interested in. But because the genetics are really variable within those seeds, the, the seeds that are saved from that plant are gonna be very, have a really large variety of characteristics. So if you try to save those seeds, some would look like the first parent, some would look like the second parent, some would be a random mix. So there's not really any consistency, which is why those seeds are really bad for saving seeds from. And so this is totally different from heirloom plants. So heirloom plants, on the other hand, they're open pollinated. They have a really wide and vast genetic pool and the, they produce seeds that are true to type, meaning that they have characteristics similar to the plant that they came from. So when you grow out heirloom seeds, you're very likely going to get seeds that look like the parent plant. So heirloom seeds are just a specific valuable kind of open pollinated plant. They're usually passed down from generations. Um, they have really valuable characteristics like hardiness, color, or flavor, and often have some sentimental value. You know, a lot of the people I work with um, are really interested in saving their heirloom seeds because, you know, it's what they grew up um, eating or it's what they grew up growing with their families as well. So there's a lot of different value with the heirloom seeds. And we, we've lost, um, it felt like when I was younger, there was a huge shift more towards the hybrid type seeds, but I feel like heirlooms are coming back right now. So a lot of people are interested in, in that because with the F1 hybrids, as you mentioned, you get the disease resistance and maybe like a drought resistance, but they may not have necessarily been breeding for flavor. And I think people started craving flavor again in their say tomatoes. So Jamie, do you have uh, more people that, that call asking about heirlooms, do you feel like, or are, are we seeing now a combination of those things? Yeah, exactly. I do get a lot of people who are interested in growing heirloom plants and also with the volunteers that I work with as well. But often we do still suggest different hybrids. Um, if there's a problem area or a problem disease that is chronic in a yard or something like that, the hybrids can be, you know, they're very effective um, for the traits that they have. So I still recommend them to people, but I absolutely do get a lot of 
um, especially schools and community gardens, because they are really interested in saving seeds, right? They wanna be able to teach students um, about the entire life cycle of the plant, which includes saving seeds and heirlooms are gonna be one of the best to do that from. Yeah, it takes, that takes me like all the way back to high school biology. I remember when we would do the genetic squares, that's not the right term, but pennant squares? Punnets. Yes. Yes. Oh, I remember doing that and we would, yeah, we would like compare each other's genetics. And if we had a baby, this is what it would be like. And, you know, that wasn't awkward with your sitting next to your high school crush at all. So, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Jamini, when we're, we're talking about seed starting, uh, saving seed, uh, we do get questions of this matter all the time. Um, at the extension office. And so I would, would you like to help us answer some of these uh, questions? Yes, I'm ready. Excellent. So uh, Ken, I think you are up this week in terms of kicking off the, the homeowner questions. If you wouldn't mind getting us started, please. All right. First question comes from McDonough County um, and they have saved tomato seeds from last year and put them in a zip uh, top plastic bag. Uh, the seed looks like it might have mold on them. Are they still good to plant and can they be salvaged? Oh no. Unfortunately, I would say they're probably not um, good to plant. So that mold is probably damaging to the seeds and you're not really going to get good germination from that whole bag of seeds in the future. Um, what that person could do is they could try fermenting their wet seeds. And what that does is that just dissolves that wet gel casing and then make sure that they're really fully drying their seeds out before they're storing them. Um, I also recommend to people to store them in a paper envelope or something else like that that's porous rather than a plastic bag, which will just trap um, wet mildew and moisture. Our next question comes from Adams County. This person would like to plant milkweed seeds, but they're seeing that people say to plant them in the fall. Is it too late to plant milkweed seed for this year? So I would say it's not too late from the seeds perspective, but you might have a really difficult time digging through your frozen soil at this time of year, which is why fall is probably the best time to plant them in your garden. Um, they could just broadcast their seeds in the garden. So just kind of like throw them to be on top of the soil, but you're likely going to lose a lot of seeds that way. And it's harder to um, know where your plants are going to be growing in the next season if you just broadcast them. Um, so what I like to do is I would recommend that they store them indoors and plant them in the spring. So the reason that milkweed is going to be good to plant in the fall is because these seeds actually need a cold and moist environment to break their seed dormancy. So AKA winter, right? They need to go through our winter period, but you can mimic that indoors by taking your milkweed seeds and wrapping them in a wet paper towel or in a container of wet sand and putting them in your refrigerator for 30 days. And then you can plant them outside in the spring. So another thing that you could do this winter instead of broadcasting your seeds or going through this process indoors in your fridge would be to plant them in an outdoor um, container, but that's a, in a winter sowing container. So often I've seen people use um, old milk gallons that you just kind of cut in half and you plant the milkweed in that, um, in the bottom half of the milk jug and then leave those outdoors. So they're still getting, you know, the cold weather, rained on, snowed on. Um, and then as they grow in the spring, they're easier than to transplant exactly where you want them in their garden. We had a, a take home kit for school kids uh, that uh, Wendy, our producer helped put together. And it, hopefully we're gonna see a lot more milkweed in our neck of the woods. So <laughs> some people might not like hearing that, but we are excited to, to see more milkweed growing in our, our area. Yeah, I'm excited for that. Yeah, so the, the last couple of years for our milkweed, I've seeded them in January, just put them in the flats and then put those flats out in the garage until like March and then bring them in, start them inside. So I kind of get a head start for them and then plant them outside once it warms up. So I've had pretty good success, success with that. 
just put those flats in a plastic bag out in the garage and and let them sit. I know. Yeah, we had, that's great. Uh, there was a professor at WIU, Dr. Win Fippen, and he was researching milkweed as a fiber crop. And he said he has perfected the milkweed germination process. I can't remember exactly how he said it, but it's like, you know, two weeks in cold stratification, two weeks out, and then two weeks in, and then you take it back out and it's like almost 100% germination. Um, and if he was listening to me, he'd be very upset that I'm telling you, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it help like, if he, what was that Katie? Sorry. I said, it'd help if everybody had an in-home growth chamber. <laughs> yes. yes. And, you know, $350,000 greenhouse to do it. Right. All. So yeah, you know, that would, that would definitely help and grad students to keep track of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Our next question is from email. Um, so this person did not get a chance to save seed from their sweet peppers this year. Uh, so they brought those plants inside uh, and the plants started to grow new peppers in December, uh, but those uh, fruit are tiny. Uh, should they save the seeds from those stunted small peppers? So my guess is depending on how stunted the growth is that these tiny peppers probably won't even produce seeds. So sweet peppers are, they need a hot environment to really grow well. And if they aren't getting the right amount of warmth or light, the peppers probably wouldn't produce seed. Um, and so I guess that's my answer to this question. <laughs> if anybody else, uh, else has anything else to add, um, but I would recommend probably not saving the seeds from them. Well, I'm curious, uh, Ken, do you know, do peppers need pollination? Like, do they need a pollinator? Um, you know, I, I noticed when apples don't get pollinated or when they get a little misshapen, is that the same with peppers or? Uh, yeah, I don't know about peppers, but yeah, like a lot of fruits like um, cucumbers and stuff, you don't get good pollination. You get those, <clears throat> you can get distorted fruits. Um, that could be another thing. They don't have viable seed that kind of pushes that fruit production. So Jamie, I'm gonna give you a break for a bit and ask Chris this question. It comes from Morgan County, and this person is asking about dormant seeding lawns. Can they sow their lawn seed in the winter? Um, in our neck of the woods, it can be done. I, don't, I hate saying that it can't be done because, some, you know what? My neighbor actually dormant seeded his lawn, and I said to my wife, that's, that's never going to take. That's never going to work. <laughs> well... Who thought it in 2020, he's got a beautiful lush lawn in that spot that he sowed. So um, I, I would say that dormant seeding lawns is typically a technique used by golf courses. Uh, it's what they use to help replenish those genetics, you know, a new, new genetics, better disease resistance um, for say a golf course. When do they have an off season at a golf course? Well, they really don't uh, when the golfers aren't there. So they usually have to do some type of a dormant seeding. Uh, they might use a slit seed or something like that, but for the most part, it's a golf course technique. So you have someone that has a degree in turf grass management. Uh, you have a full-time staff, you have equipment, you've got a dedicated irrigation system. So there's a lot of stuff that goes into this dormant seeding things for lawns. Um, or you can just have my neighbor and, they get lucky. So um, I would say uh, when you dormant seed, it should probably happen earlier in the year because you do want snow cover to help pack some of that seed down uh, against the soil, uh, kind of similar to that, that milkweed seed. And so, yeah, I, I, it's not necessarily going to be very successful. I would just wait until spring as things start to warm up and our soil gets a little warmer uh, and, and put the seed down at that point in time. The other thing I do notice also is in like where I seeded, where we had our old swimming pool this year, birds are loving that spot because there's a bunch of seed right there. And so you're gonna get some predation that might occur uh, in spots that you would dormant seed. And if, if you don't get it into the soil. So that's it. I'm not gonna say it's not gonna work, but I'm gonna say it's highly unlikely unless you have a, a turf grass management degree, a full-time staff, um, and hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of equipment behind you, or you are my neighbor. That's my answer. It's definitely a gamble, especially since you don't know what's going to happen further mm -hmm. on down the road. Yeah. If we get a late spring and that stuff never gets a chance to germinate, mm -hmm. it'll probably just rot. Get rid of your turf, plant some flowers. There you go. More milkweed. <laughs> 
All right. And then our last question comes from Champaign County. Um, and a teacher wants to know what can be seeded in a school garden very, very early and grow in time for the kids to see flowers or to harvest. So it looks like they're maybe looking for either flowers and or vegetables. So my favorite go-to for school gardens at the beginning of the year are peas. You can plant them super early and the students still get a chance to harvest and eat the snap peas. Um, so that's my favorite one. Do you guys have any favorites? I've been told radishes are a good option. Yeah, and some of the, the smaller carrots, like the ox heart type, the short squat ones, you can get fairly decent sized carrots before school's out. Lettuce is good too. I was kind of wondering about microgreens. You're not out in the garden necessarily. You would be inside, but microgreens could be something. I guess you've got to be careful. Some microgreens can be a little spicy. So mm -hmm. it might turn the kids off if they take a bite into like a spicy radish or something. And it's like, whoa. Um, but I guess if the teacher wants to invest a little more money in like a cold frame or season extension, you might be able to push that envelope a little bit more. But, but yeah, I, I snap peas. Um, oh, those are delicious. And, you know, I'm trying to think anything else, radishes, you know, maybe a quick turnip crop, but uh, if you get a kid to eat a turnip or not. So <laughs> snap peas might be your best option. I can't think of a flower off the top of my head. Dandelion. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Good, yeah, let's plant a crop of dandelion. Over. <laughs> they could also plant bulbs in the fall and then get them yeah. in the early spring, but that would be the season before, right? So they would have to plant it. Might not be the same kids, you know? Mm -hmm. But still, I think, yeah, let's go with spring bulbs. You can force some yeah. spring bulbs even inside. Yeah. So that would be a lot of fun to do. Or, or I know our colleague, Martha Smith, she loves talking about forcing branches, you know, go find some forsythia, lilac, and bring those inside and you can force a bloom in the indoors off of that in, this, in the winter time. So yeah, there's options. There's, there could be flowers. So yeah, way to go team. We did it. <laughs> well, that was a lot of great information. I want to give a wholehearted thanks to Jamie for being on the show today. I know this is, I feel like we're a nonstop Zoom meeting. So Jamie, thanks for stopping by at our Zoom meeting today to chat with us about seed saving, seed starting. Uh, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all for having me. I had a lot of fun. And we shall, we have a lot of fun here on this show as well. It is produced by Wendy Ferguson and edited by me, Chris Enroth. Of course, a huge thanks goes to our co-hosts here every single week. Ken and Katie, thanks so much for being on our show and leading us through the topic of the week, which just happens to be seed starting and saving this week. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie and Ken and Chris. Thanks. It's always good to see you guys. Yes, thanks again, Jamie. Katie, Chris, let's do this again next week. Uh, yes, we will do this again next week uh, because we're going to be talking with N Nicole Flowers Kimberly uh, about seed catalogs. So you're saving some seed. Well, let's talk about some seed catalogs, folks. If you want to order those plants to come to your doorstep this year and get that garden off on the right start. So we'll chat with Nicole about that. And as always, listeners, thanks for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always... Keep on growing.